The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Well, people sometimes ask me, how did you get involved in astronomy? I said, I got born. What's your problem? Meet John Dobson. He spent most of his 92 years on this planet contemplating the cosmos, simply because it's there. You might call him the quintessential amateur. The word amateur comes from the Latin word for love. And an amateur astronomer is someone who uh, goes out and could be just idly learning constellations or looking through a small telescope, or it could be going all the way to doing valuable scientific research for the love of it. In 1968, Dobson co-founded the San Francisco Sidewalk Astronomers Club, sparking an international renaissance in amateur astronomy. And our meeting was just meeting on the sidewalk with our telescopes. So we became famous all over the city, all over the Bay Area, people knew. If you want to look through a telescope, go to Jackson and Broderick Street on any clear night. These informal gatherings now happen on sidewalks and hillsides the world over. We have a star party like this four times a year at a solstice or an equinox, and this is uh, near the winter solstice. And the telescopes are provided by the San Francisco amateur astronomers. You can get started for less than $200 with something that will be worth looking through. It'll show you things you won't see otherwise. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> With just a small telescope, you can see the rings of Saturn, the craters of the moon, the atmospheric bands and moons of Jupiter, star clusters, nebulae, and, you, and galaxies millions of light years away. With larger telescopes, the uh, volume of space that you can see goes up considerably. You can go up to where you see thousands or hundreds of thousands of galaxies. You can see stars exploding a billion light years away. There's no limit to what you can see out there. It's one of the appealing things about, uh, about the universe. Since the dawn of consciousness, humans have been gazing at the stars. But what we could see was constrained by the limitations of the human eye. That changed in 1609, when Italian scientist Galileo first constructed a simple refractor telescope to enhance our ability to investigate the night sky. This type of telescope that you're seeing here, it's a refractor telescope. And it's what you know, everyone kind of thinks of when they think of a telescope, they, they think of a refractor. And a refractor telescope receives light that's transmitted from objects in space and bends or refracts it through clear optical lenses into an eyepiece. It's a simple, durable design that produces sharp, steady images. But because glass lenses must be carefully crafted and treated in order to transmit color accurately, larger models tend to be significantly more expensive than their smaller counterparts. A reflector telescope uses mirrors to bounce or reflect light into an eyepiece. Although less stable than glass lenses, mirrors are cheaper to manufacture and they reflect all visible wavelengths evenly, producing a bright, color-accurate image for a reasonable price. And with both types, size matters. A telescope's total power depends on its aperture, the diameter of its primary lens or mirror. That's where John Dobson comes in. Up until John Dobson uh, came up with his new design, telescopes eight, 10 inches were considered about the limit of what most people could afford or aspire to, um, John started building them two, three times that size. That was a big boost for people that uh, want to catch a lot of photons. That's the way you do it. Get a great big light bucket, and John figured out how to do it. The Dobsonian telescope is a reflector type that's modeled after the one that was originally designed by Sir Isaac Newton in 1704. Dobson's modifications included increasing the size of the reflecting mirror, simplifying the mount, and constructing it by hand from cheap, lightweight materials like cardboard tubes, plywood, and salvaged glass that he painstakingly grinds and polishes by hand. 
Over the years, Dobson has coaxed untold numbers of passers-by to look through his telescopes, and in doing so, he's offered them a new perspective on their place in the universe. I think other people think of me as a teacher. I just see myself as a, as a curious worm that got born in this place and worried about it. <laughs> So what you're looking at is the Andromeda Galaxy. It's the next nearest spiral galaxy to our own Milky Way. It's about 2.3 million light years away. So the light you're seeing actually left there about 2.3 million years ago and has been traveling through space. For many amateur astronomers, merely looking and wondering about the universe is not enough. They're compelled to capture their cosmic discoveries in photographs. I'll show you a picture of what you just saw. So this picture. I uh, was taken through this same telescope a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago. Yep. The best astrophotography being done in the world now is largely being done by amateur astronomers. And it's showing us aspects of the universe that we hadn't really seen before. These amateur astrophotographers have done a lot to present us with the aesthetic side of the universe. And their contributions to astronomy go beyond aesthetics. Amateurs regularly discover comets, supernovas, and even new planets. There are areas of scientific research that professionals can't do. Uh, things that require a lot of telescope time looking for rare events. For instance, big telescopes are expensive. There's a lot of demand on them. You know, a professional can't just kind of wander around looking for stuff or monitor stars waiting for them to flare up. But amateur astronomers can, they can do whatever they please. And astronomy is perfect for hobbyists who have a penchant for gear. Some, like Jim Scala, take their passion and the requisite disposable income to their natural limits. Well, the epitome of every amateur astronomer is to have his own observatory in his backyard. Whenever the seeing is nice, he can just go up there and turn his telescope on the stars. And uh, as I got older, I said, hey, uh, you know, you got to do this one of these days or you're not going to be able to do it. So I did it. Jim was 13 years old when he built his first telescope using instructions from Scientific American magazine. In 1980, he started building this observatory in his backyard in Lafayette, California. 30 years and roughly $60,000 later, Scala's backyard observatory has evolved to become part personal retreat and part monument to the stars. The main component of the observatory is a nine inch refracting telescope with a triplet lens designed by Thomas M. Back. It's a very, very good planetary telescope. That means it's ideal for looking at fine details such as on the planets or the moon or even uh, star clusters and so forth in deep sky. My main interest in astronomy has always been the question, is anybody out there? That's why I was always interested in the planets because life would have to exist on planets. So that leads into a lot of other things, cosmology, uh, the origin of the stars, the origin of the solar system, the way in which solar systems are planned. So it's just been a lifelong quest. If you find yourself at sea in a small unlighted boat, alone in the darkness of a cloudless night. And if you gaze into the darkness of the space between the stars, then keep wide awake. And if your mind is full of wonder and your heart is full of peace, there is a chance that you will understand. Now oh, this is a fabulous show. All right, everybody come and have a look. Wow.